Well, it's no secret we're living in some uncertain times with this coronavirus situation changing by the hour or sometimes by the minute, or at least it seems that way. So what are we to do? Well, what are Christians supposed to do about this pandemic? Well, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, Paul encourages believers who had lost loved ones to not grieve or sorrow like the rest of men do who have no hope. And Paul's going to tell people who are following Jesus not to grieve. And, and today he might tell us the same thing. He might tell us to not live like the rest of the men and women who have no hope as well. So as Christians, we have to deal with this pandemic. We're still subject to the laws of the universe, the physical laws and the medical laws and all the things that everybody else is subject to. The difference is we have a hope within us. We have a Heavenly Father we can go to in prayer and we can use this as an opportunity to share the love of God with other people. And that's what we're going to look at today in this lesson. So get your Bibles, open up to 1 Thessalonians and to Isaiah 6, and while you're doing that, don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Just click on the subscribe bar right there, and then this notification bell pops up, and you'll be notified any time I make any change to the channel content. All set? All right. And remember, if you're not careful, you might just learn something before we're done. So let's get started. I want to welcome everybody, especially those uh, who are here and on Facebook, wherever you may be watching. Thank you for joining us. Well, it's no secret that things have gotten a little bit crazy on us here in the last couple of weeks. And we can just look around us and see that there's a lot of fear. There is a lot of uncertainty going on in the world. And the situation seems to be changing by the hour, sometimes even sooner than that. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul encouraged believers there who had lost loved ones to not grieve as those who have no hope. Now, I believe that the concept he's talking about there can apply to us today because there are a lot of people who are living in fear and anxiety and panic in some cases. We can see that by some of the buying that's going on. But we have a living hope that we don't have to live that way. That's 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4, verse 13 up there, where hope is a key word in it. 2 Timothy chapter 1, we looked at last week, verse 7, Paul said, God has not given us a spirit of timidity, uh, but, a, but a spirit of discipline, of love, of power. Therefore, encourage one another with these words, 1 Thessalonians 4.18 says, so I want to give everybody some kind of encouragement today. And I want us to be able to go away with this feeling that, that we're going to get through this. It might be a little bumpy ahead. There might be some sharp turns, kind of like on a roller coaster, but we'll, we'll get through this. And so I call this just responding to the coronavirus. Today is part two. Remember that. Therefore, we will. The title probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but I want us to look at some things we need to remember. To start with, we need to remember that God is still in control. God is still on the throne. God has still got everything. Even though it doesn't look to us like everything is under control, it is. I like to think of it sometimes as one of the stage productions we're in. Out front, everything uh, you can see, all you see is what's out front on the stage. You don't see what's going on behind the scenes. Everything that's being done to, for the actors and the producers and the uh, set uh, being set up. You just see the finished product, and that's many times the way it is with God. We just see the finished product. We don't know what is going on behind the scenes, but God is still on the throne. God has still got everything under control. In Isaiah chapter 6, here's a time here when a nation was um, uh, uh, in turmoil, basically, when the king died. And that year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple, and above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by uh, the voice of the, him who cried uh, out, and the voice was filled with smoke. 
And so I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people with unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having his, in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. Notice a couple of things here. King Uzziah had reigned for a long time. And overall, he was a pretty good king. Uh, they had not had a king of his caliber since Solomon. And now he is gone. So what is the next king going to be like? You see, they, they needed something to, to hope in. And at that time, it was easy for people to lose hope. That's the one thing about a monarchy is you never really know. You can have a really good king, really good emperor, and you don't know what's going to happen when the next one comes in. Uh, king Louis the Fourteenth in Spain or in uh, France rather was about five or six years old when his father died, and his mother had to rule as a regent for most of the time uh, until his adulthood. And part of the reason that Nicholas the Second was the last Tsar of Russia, he was not prepared because his father died suddenly when he was about forty-nine or so, and uh, Nicholas was about twenty-five when he became Tsar. Unprepared was not taken to a lot of meetings, was not really given a lot of pointers by his dad, who was a very forceful man. And that can happen when you switch uh, monarchs. You don't know what the next one's going to be like. And unlike us, when we uh, have a pr someone running for president, they pick their running mate, they can have some qualifications. Uh, it's kind of hard to uh, pick your offspring uh, in the, those kinds of situations. And no earthly king could help the situation that Judah was going to find themselves in. Judah was finding themselves in a situation where Assyria is becoming a threat again. So what's the next king going to be like? Well, God can many times in these situations get our attention a lot easier than he can when things are going good. It's when we have uh, rough times and we have to turn to God that he can get our attention because then all of a sudden, have you noticed that self-confidence tends to go away? Complacency uh, tends to go away when we realize, uh-oh, something's, something's not right here. In the year of King Uzziah's death, Israel is kind of on, on uncertain ground. They don't know what, what's going to happen next. And complacency can really set in, and so it then has to uh, go away. And God will use times like this to get our attention sometimes. Judah, no doubt, was feeling at this time, uh, with their king gone, that uh, they're feeling troubled, they're uncertain. Uh, who's the next king going to be? What's he going to be like? Well, we really don't have any idea what he's going to be like, but we have to remember that God is in control. God's got the situation well in hand. We just have to uh, move ahead uh, using, like we talked about last week, common sense, uh, things like washing our hands, keeping our distance. If you're in a high-risk group, to take the precautions and, and move on ahead. But God is going to be in control of the situation. We know that. Matthew chapter 28, where Jesus said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Notice he says, All authority has been given unto him in heaven and on earth. So what does that tell us? Well, that tells us that nothing is outside of his sovereign control. There's nothing that goes on in this world that God doesn't know that it's happening. So why do some things happen? Well, that gets into a whole discussion about the will of God, his purposeful will versus his permissive will. Another discussion, maybe sometime for another time. But the major message we have to understand is that when Jesus was one raised from the dead, and now he has the authority of God himself, Remember back when Satan was trying to tempt Jesus. And he said, hey, you know, if you just bow down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world and all their splendor. And that's when uh, uh, Jesus told him, uh, resisted it, told him, get behind me because it is worship you shall, uh, written, rather you shall not tempt the Lord your God. He was not going to give him. Besides, Satan really couldn't uh, control, uh, didn't have the control that he thought he did over, over the kingdoms of the world. And then let's also remember that not only that, but God is one who can be trusted. Now here's where we have to always keep in mind, keep this little tidbit in mind. When God does something, sure, he's in control. He does listen to prayers. He does answer prayers. There's no such thing as an unanswered prayer. The thing is that we don't always get them answered the way that we want them to. You always have to remember that. Uh, prayers and things that, that uh, when we go to God in prayer, he's going to give us an answer. The answer sometimes is no. The answer sometimes is yes. Sometimes we have to wait a while. It's not always going to be exactly what we want when we want it. Notice Psalm chapter 28 in verse 7. We're told, The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in Him and I am helped. Therefore my heart rejoices and I pray, uh, praise Him with my song. 
Notice that the psalmist there is showing his, his expression, uh, his expressions of confidence, his expression that he knows that God is going to keep this under control. In John chapter 14, when faced with a certain uh, failure even, we can still have confidence in what uh, God tells us there. We have assurance in Jesus' words right there. Remember, he said that in my Father's house are many mansions. He told them, you believe in God, you believe, believe in me. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when did he say that? It was right before he went to the cross. When at a time when they're, they're really getting nervous about what's happening, they don't understand, the disciples don't understand what's happening, but God is trustworthy. He is going to uh, see us through the hard times. And then notice here in uh, Psalm, uh, or rather Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, familiar passage, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding. That's probably the hardest part for any of us to do is to not lean on our own human understanding. Because remember, we have limited knowledge. We don't know what's going on. Remember the, the, uh, the illustration of a, of a play. You don't know what's going on behind the scenes to make all that production come out right. Uh, and uh, we don't know what's going on behind the scenes uh, with God. God reveals himself to us through the pages of Scripture. God reveals himself uh, through Jesus to us. So we have to trust in, in the Lord and lean not on our own understanding in all our ways uh, acknowledge Him. And then let's also remember that God is our help. Psalm 121, He is our help in a time of need. Remember that. Keep that in mind. Even Especially when our footing gets a little bit shaky. I know a little bit about that. I've had to walk on some uh, grounds when I grew up as a kid. Shaky ground because of the, uh, the ice and things. And sometimes I would slip. And sometimes with our, our footing in life gets that way. But we keep our trust in God. We keep stepping carefully, and God is going to be with us on our journey and provide us the sure footing that we need. We just have to make sure we're following what God wants us to do. Someone once said, obey God, leave the consequences to Him. Remember that God is still on His throne. He can be trusted. He is going to be our help. Therefore, this is the therefore part of it. Therefore, we will. What are we going to do? Remember, therefore is reaching a conclusion. Therefore, we will not fear. We will trust. Now remember, fear does not mean that you are big and bold and bad like you're in a John Wayne movie. Fear means you're going to feel it. But this is where courage comes in. I feel the fear, but I'm going to go anyway. I feel the fear of, uh, of what's going on with this coronavirus, uh, the anxiety. I feel it, but I'm going to move ahead. I'm going to put my trust in God. I'm going to take care of my family. I'm going to take care of business to the best of my ability. And I'm going to just trust in God that these things are going to uh, work out. We will fear, we will not trust. Even when I uh, wish I uh, walk through the darkest valley, Psalm 23, I will not be afraid. I will keep going. I will press ahead. The Lord is going to be my light and my salvation, so why should I be afraid, we're told uh, in, in Psalm 24. The Lord is my light. I'm sorry, Psalm 27, verses 1 and 3. The Lord is going to be my light. He's going to light that path for me. Even if I'm attacked, I can still remain confident. Even if things do go down, I can still remain confident. We will not worry. We will pray. How many people have increased their prayer life during this time? That would be an interesting question to ask. I knew someone years ago whose uh, wife was having medical issues, and he finally said, well, we've tried everything else. I guess it's time to put you on the prayer list. He got that in the backwards order. The prayer list should come first. I mean, yes, seek out whatever medical, whatever help you need, but don't forget the prayer uh, to, to use the avenue of prayer. We talked last week how uh, God doesn't always work miraculously. Remember, we still have all these physical laws and things in the universe that govern it and that are going to govern the way that we deal with this uh, coronavirus and anything else uh, that comes along in life. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is emphatic that his disciples not be overly concerned about their daily needs because they're going to be met. I have confidence they're going to be met. I may not have the biggest, fanciest house in town, but I'm going to have a roof over my head. I may not have uh, uh, pheasant under glass or filet mignon or steak every night, but we're going to have food to eat. We're going to be taken care of. That's something that, uh, that I don't have to worry about. And the intent is not to be careless in our attitudes, but the intent is to keep our priorities. I knew a man years ago, and I, some of the conversations I had with him, I'd walk away, and you've heard people say, oh, that, that makes my brain hurt. Well, this guy made my brain hurt. 
his idea about faith, and, and he said that the problem everybody has is a lack of faith. And I'll concede the point. Everybody at some point in time has issues with faith. But his idea about how God would take care of us is basically he should be able to sit out in a field and do absolutely nothing, and God would just rain everything down on him. But there is a little bit of a problem when you look at how uh, Paul told the Thessalonians that if a man shall not work, neither shall he eat. That God, and even in the Old Testament, said that we are going to have to till uh, the ground. He said that back in Genesis chapter 3. The idea of working for a living and providing for our families is something that is very biblical. The idea of just sitting there and doing nothing is not at all biblical. But Jesus wants us to have the idea that we have a sense of priorities. Plan for the future. Save for your retirement. Take necessary precautions uh, in a situation like we're facing with, uh, with this pandemic. Take all those necessary precautions, but remember, keep God number one. Keep your priorities in the proper order. That's what he's wanting us to do. In Philippians chapter 4, we're told some promises there, beginning in verse 4. If you have a Bible, turn over to Philippians chapter 4. beginning in verse 4, where uh, he tells us to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Notice that's twice there in that one verse. He says rejoice. Then he says, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Now watch this. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses uh, all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now notice a couple things here uh, that, he's, that he's telling us uh, is number one, that, uh, we'll have the, that we'll be touched with the mark of the supernatural, that is of God answering our, our prayers. He is outside the laws of physics. And then we're going to, um, uh, by, sup, by prayer, by, uh, God's peace will guard us. And then the third promise is just the peace of God generally being given to us. But I want you to notice a couple things. When he says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. How, when was the last time you, you gave thanks to God for the possessions that you have? It's, and then he says, let your requests be made known to God. Requests, that means we can go to God with specific things, specifically to, to end um, this pandemic, specifically with needs that we have that come up. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The peace of God will come in uh, to guard. And that, that word for guard is a military term. It was a term used for guarding a fortress. You know, the peace of God will pass all of our human understanding. The problem is we many times just don't let it. We, we like to try and control things on our own. And we got to remember, there's a lot of things in this world that are beyond our control. I can control myself when I get in the car. I can be completely sober. I can't control the other driver coming the other way. If he's been drinking or doing something, I can't control that. I can't control the weather. I can't control the pandemic. All I can do is trust God that things uh, in this situation are going to work out. Notice, too, in James chapter 1, beginning in verse 2, when he says, my brethren, can count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Now, this used to be a problem for me. I'm having trials. I'm, you know, life is really rough. How am I supposed to count it all joy? Anybody else ever have that problem? I'm sure most of us have at one time or another. But what, what he's getting at is a couple of things. Is, is first of all, it's not that I'm, oh, hap I'm, I'm happy that I'm out of work and, and all these things are going wrong, but I can count it all joy that God is going to, number one, be looking out and taking care of me, and number two, uh, he also goes on to say, let, uh, let me back up here. He says, uh, let patience have its perfect work. That's one thing God may be trying to teach me is some patience, and that you may be perfect and complete, land lacking nothing. And if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord, for he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. 
So there's an undeniable truth of life about our trials and temptations that come our way. And the Greek word here for temptation or trials is a word that has to do with uh, uh, bringing to prove us. It's not tr uh, temptation in the sense God's going to tempt us to evil. He doesn't do that. But he is going to throw temptation or trials and, and, and tests our way. And that could be what's going on right now in the world. I don't know. I'm not going to pretend to have any answers there. But the idea is we can consider it joy that I'm going to come through this. It's the old Frederick Nietzsche line that that, doesn't, that that which does not kill me makes me stronger. I'm going to come through this with the joy that i am still got the peace of God that is ruling in my heart. I've got the, the peace of God, the guidance of God that's going to carry me through this. There's where the joy comes in, not in the trial itself. Because this is where we have to remember to keep our focus uh, in, the, uh, in the right place. Because in Matthew uh, chapter, uh, we're going to see in a minute with Peter and what happened to him when he tried to walk on the water. But we also, uh, therefore, can live uh, as a light and live differently. Now remember when he talks about light. Light is something that stands out. Light is something that uh, when we are in a dark room or on a dark road, what's the first thing your eyes are going to focus on? They're going to focus on the brightest thing they see. They're going to focus on the light. So we need to be a light. We need to be that salt and light that he wants us so people can see the blessed life that we are living. The world needs to see us as living differently right now. They always need to see us living differently. But right now especially, they need to see us living differently. They need to see us living a life uh, of peace, a life where we are uh, dedicated to prayer. And not only that, but a life dedicated to compassion and dedicated to helping those around us. Looked at that a little bit last week. We'll be looking a little more at that uh, in the coming weeks as well. So we can show compassion as well as we serve others. There's going to be a lot of people in the next couple of weeks that can't get out for one reason or the other. It's not safe for them to go out because their compromised immune systems or, or whatever their, their particular situation is. There is an opportunity here for us to step up. Uh, and uh, be a help and to be a service of those that are around us. There's a very good opportunity there just to be uh, out and about as much as we can safely do it and be a help and a light to those who need it. And then remember to pray for national healing and revival. We looked a little bit last week at Second Chronicles chapter 7, but we need revival. We need people to turn back, turn their hearts back towards uh, towards the Lord. And revival, remember, is characterized by brokenness, first of all, and that comes from recognizing our own weaknesses. Yeah, we've got technology. We can put a man on the moon. We've got the internet. I don't know where people are right now watching this. I'm assuming it got out live. Uh, last week we had our technical difficulties. But we have to remember that we are still not God. We are still not at, uh, anywhere where we, can, where we can challenge God. It still comes back to we are made in God's image. We still need God just as much as we did before. We have to admit our own human weaknesses and our own human frailties. And then revival is going to be characterized by a sense of urgency as well. We are told that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He is being very patient uh, with us, but we need to have that sense of urgency, that it is urgent that not only do we provide physical relief, but we need to provide the spiritual and the emotional relief as well. And then revival is going to be characterized by holiness. Notice in Second Chronicles chapter 7, he wants his people, he says, to turn from their wicked ways. Now, we're all sinners. That's a, that's a, that's a given. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We don't need to turn it into a contest if I'm a better sinner or worse sinner than you are, however you want to look at it. But the point being is everybody has got sin in their lives they need to turn from. Could be something as simple as cleaning up our language, or it could be something as simple as giving up a life of crime. Everybody's going to be different on that one. And everybody's going to have their own uh, 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 sins that they're going to have to deal with and carry on or, uh, or overcome. And then we need to fix our eyes on Jesus. We need to focus on Jesus, not the crisis. Matthew chapter 14 is where Peter goes out on the water in the storm, and uh, he are not in the storm. That, that's the, uh, a different, different uh, uh, event that happened. But when he sees Jesus at night and says, Lord, if that's you, command me to come to you. And he says, all right, come on. Peter gets out, starts walking on water. Oh, wait a minute. I'm walking on water. I can't do that. Boom, down he goes. He was focusing on what was going on around him, not 
uh, not on the Lord. And that is a tough thing to do, but it is something that we are called to do, to keep our focus on Christ, keep our focus on the Lord and not on the storm around us. That's where our ultimate peace is going to come from. That's where the, the peace of God that, that transcends all understanding is going to come from, is when we have our focus where it needs to be. Sickness is going to come our way. Trials and tribulations are going to come our way. But where is our focus? What are we looking at when we get into those? Are we keeping our focus on the finish line, on the ultimate prize? When I ran track in high school, uh, I, I was in a couple of races where I started to slow down. And in one case, I can remember starting to look over my shoulder and the coach or somebody yelling at me to keep looking forward. In other words, because when you're in, running in a race and you start to, it doesn't take much of turning your head and you slow down. It slows you way down and you lose focus. Keep looking at the finish line. Keep looking and pushing ahead. And that's when, where our focus needs to be as Christians. It needs to be on the Lord, on Christ, and pushing ahead, not looking at the crisis. Keep our focus where it needs to be. So this morning, be encouraged. Remember that God is still on the throne. Remember not to worry, but to pray. Remember to trust. Remember to uh, let our faith be built by this. And as we close, let's go to God in prayer and especially lift up those that we know who are being uh, 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 affected greatly by this. Some have lost loved ones. Let's all go to God in prayer. We thank you, Lord, for the avenue of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the comfort that it brings. Help us as we go from this place to be the light that we need to be and to be the salt that we need to be so that others can see us living differently. And help us in the end, Lord, to win souls. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.